going to have a few minutes to uh, deliver an opening statement. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Go right ahead. All right, are we going to, are we yeah, worried no. about the feedback again? No, do, do whatever. All right, let's you give it a try. You want to go. I, have no, I, don't, I don't think there is an answer. So. Bad, I, okay. Well, very good afternoon to everyone, and thank you so much for coming out. I, I, I got, I'm very active in my home uh, Democratic Club in Santa Monica. I'm also a member here, and I know how much incredible work you guys do to get, get the vote out and, and help elect progressive candidates, wonderful Democratic candidates in our area. Uh, it's been a whirlwind working with these guys, uh, going out and meeting with, with, with various clubs, but it's been a great, a great honor to, to run and, and, uh, and, and engage with people all over this incredibly large and diverse and interesting district. Uh, I think I'm actually the only candidate uh, who, who grew up here. I have deep, very, very deep roots here. Went to public schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. Went off to the East Coast. I was, went elsewhere, but I finally you know, decided to come back to California. I was drawn back home. Uh, and, and have been very engaged in public policy issues here uh, for quite some time. I've, I've gotten a, I, I grew up in a, in a, in a very special environment. I, 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 there was a period of time in California where we had this California dream that, that, that where, where there was job growth, where there was economic prosperity, where we had truly invested in all the great public infrastructure and a, and a really strong educational system. And that, that dream has become very fragile. Uh, when I was at law school, I had the opportunity to serve as the one student member of the University of California's Board of Regents, which was an extraordinary experience. I worked a great deal on, on affordability issues. I worked on sustainability issues. Had the chance to travel all over the state and meet with students who were really worried about where they were and, and the extent to which they were having to leverage their futures uh, in order to, just to afford a public education. Uh, they, they, they talked to me about all their friends who hadn't even gone to the university because they were so worried about the debt that they may have to accrue. Uh, I decided to come back home to Santa Monica. I ran for the school board in 2008, right before the election. The economy hit the skids, and we were in. We were suddenly in a position where we were having to not just figure out how to make the school district get better, but how to make sure that we stop the school district from getting gutted. And worked very hard to try to bring in new revenues to, to try to uh, make some targeted cuts, but most importantly, think very creatively about new ways to bring in more money into the district that help to preserve and protect a lot of those critical programs uh, like nurses and PE and, and so many other programs that, 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 that really make a difference for, for, for children, uh, counselors, music and arts, etc. I've been uh, teaching in, uh, education law and policy at UCLA Law School for the last three years. I've been serving on the school board now for the last six years. Uh, I, I care a great deal about a lot of the critical quality of life of issues that are at play here in our district. Preservation of open space, overdevelopment, fighting against climate change. I care a great deal about a lot of the critical issues that have been discussed by some of my fellow candidates. Expanding access to health care, trying to help to in improve our, our, our infrastructure, particularly with regards to transportation, creating more multimodal transit options for people and getting more investment into the growth of our metro system. I'm also very, very interested in job creation and job growth. That's really going to be how we're going to get out of the economy. We have anemic growth right now and it's so important to work both with the public and private sectors to grow our economy, to create more good, clean jobs for people, to enter into the middle class and and, and be able to thrive and grow moving forward. So that's my time, and I'm looking forward to the questions. Okay, Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ben. Okay, well, we'll start uh, with, with transportation then. Um, uh, we're, we're having sort of a renaissance of transportation here in Los Angeles. We have uh, many more uh, spikes that are going up, uh, many more uh, different lines. But the, the development around transportation uh, in some areas uh, is pricing out people who are transit dependent. And so how can we create a system uh, and is it need to be done at the statewide level to ensure that transportation oriented development doesn't price out the very people who need transportation the most and are dependent on it That's the most? That's such a great question and it's, it's such a great question. Um, now it's part of the reason why. You know, stop, stop. Yeah. No, that, that's that's part of the reason. That's part of the reason why some of the affordable housing issues that were discussed with SB 1818 are important. Though, of course, one of the problems with SB 1818, one of the concerns that's out there right now with that bill, is that it may lead, it may actually incentivize certain buildings that currently have a lot of affordable housing to be take, torn down and replaced by new buildings which actually aren't required to have as much affordable housing. So there's some serious concerns about that bill and we have to get that addressed if we're going to move forward on this. Um, you know, one of the problems with our, that we don't, 
there is a renaissance, but I think we're still probably in the Middle Ages when it comes to, uh, to, 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 to Metro. Um, in the end of the day, if we truly had a really comprehensive system where, there were, there, where you could be going around all, that really covered the community in, in a very serious, comprehensive way, there'd be less of this price out problem. The problem is that there are not that many lines and it's, it's moving forward in a very slow pace. And so as a result, there are, there, there are not that many places to do transit-oriented development. I think that drives up the prices in a significant way. And it's one of the reasons why we have to move much more quickly toward creating a, a much more comprehensive system. That's, the system is, of course, going to work much better as it is. I mean, one of the challenges we have with the Heinz development in Santa Monica that Barbie was talking about is that the, the Expo line is a light rail. It's very slow, relatively speaking. And, you're, and, and, and it's only one line. It only connects up with the rest of the system at the very end of the line. So thinking that that's going to somehow solve our traffic problems when people need to come to and from Beverly Hills and West LA and, da and, and Westchester and the Valley and the airport, et cetera, those, are, those aren't going to be covered by the Metro. So we truly need a much more comprehensive system. And I want to work really hard on leveraging state and federal funds to help Great. to build that system. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, m I mentioned before to one of the other candidates something about the drought. Um, we're probably going to have a water bond on the ballot. Uh, the governor has this idea for uh, tunnels under uh, the Sacramento Delta. Do you support the governor's program? And if not, uh, what does need to be done in terms of water management uh, to ensure equitability uh, for all areas of California? Yeah, tough question. Uh, you know, so I, I think that the, I need to learn a lot more about these tunnels. I've been reading uh, quite a bit uh, I, I don't fully support the governor's proposal because I am concerned about some of the major environmental impacts that are associated with the tunnels, both in terms of the ecosystem and uh, the fish that get pulled in. So I'm, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very problematic proposal uh, from what I've seen. Uh, I, I will say that, that we clearly have to get serious about our system-wide uh, drought management. And of course, so much of this has to do with with you know, the folks who use the most water in the state. 75 to 80% of the water is used by agriculture. Uh, it produces about 5% um, of the state's economic output, uh, but about 75 to 80% of the state's water is used by agriculture in the Central Valley. And so we have to figure out ways to really incentivize and encourage much greater water conservation, drip irrigation, et cetera, to lower the, uh, the, the amount of water used to, to, to take care of, of agriculture there. I think there's an incredible differential uh, rate and, 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 and people in the cities are, are, are being asked to bear a really unfair uh, burden when it comes to the cost of water. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think there, you know, there's an incredible piece in the LA Times about a week or two ago about some of these gold rush era water rights, which, which incentivize all the wrong behavior. There are certain areas that are trying to sluice off as much water as they possibly can because if they let that if they if they don't use all that water every year that will lower their own rights to water in the years forward so it's almost like government agencies that sometimes try to you know zero out the budget and buy a bunch of new chairs that they don't need just to be able to retain their their allocation for the next year so we have to we, we have to close that and that's going to take some really tough bargaining within the legislature but but those kinds of things need to happen okay. all right um, so, uh, also another thing I mentioned earlier was this, this structural revenue gap that's coming like a freight train uh, once Prop 30 expires. Uh, what are the top priorities in terms of the revenue side, which is one half of the budget, <laughs> um, to, uh, res to try to fix what is going to be uh, just a long-standing problem if Prop, 13 is, uh, Prop 30 is allowed to expire and nothing replaces it? So my first answer is, is, has to do with Prop 30. Uh, it's interesting, people are surprisingly willing to, to continue the current tax system. What people, people don't like to raise taxes, but we found this over and over again on some of the measures that I've worked on, that as long as you could tell people this is preserving and protecting education and key government services without raising your taxes, people show uh, a consistent willingness to, the, the, a much greater willingness to support that sort of thing. So I think actually Prop 30 ought to be extended. I think there are some really interesting political opportunities with the extension of Prop 30. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Second of all, there's obviously a ton that needs to happen with regards to looking at our tax code, uh, looking at the, at, at the sorts of unfairnesses that exist. Uh, obviously, you know, Louisiana, Alaska, Texas, all tax oil extraction. We don't do that here in California. Last time I checked, the oil industry was pretty powerful in Texas, uh, but somehow they've been able to find it within themselves to, to allow for tax taxation of, of oil extraction. Um, there's also some interesting tweaks. You know, we've been talking a little about Prop, Prop 13, and, and one of the things I, I want to add to that conversation is um, 
uh, some of the some of the loopholes associated with reassessments, and there's a there there are some extraordinary examples out there of of major major properties that have been sold that have avoided reassessment through creating these shell companies where no one person takes over 50% of the ownership. As a result, oftentimes tens of millions of dollars are lost to the public treasury. That, those are loopholes that none of us are able to take advantage of. And uh, so those are some of the things I like to work right. Uh, the Homeowners Bill of Rights passed last year under, under with much help by Ted Lieu, uh, laying out a number of rules for mortgage servicers to follow in the foreclosure process. Uh, it's led to reductions in foreclosures statewide so far. However, we hear substantial reports, I hear them every day in my email, of uh, servicers continuing to deny eligible homeowners modifications, uh, zombie properties that the, the bank, the servicer does not, basically starts the foreclosure process, pulls it back, does not inform either the municipality or the individual and uh, the individual remains on the hook for property taxes or things of that nature. We're also seeing the uh, institutional investors coming into uh, all over the country, but especially in Los Angeles County, and picking up foreclosed property to rent out and uh, basically becoming absentee slumlords. What can the state do to in increase enforcement mm -hmm. on what is still a runaway problem of mismanagement uh, among the mortgage servicing industry? Wow. Well, clearly, uh, the, the Bill of Rights needs to be better policed, better enforced, and we need to make sure that we're putting pressure. So one of the roles that we would have as a legislator uh, it would be to put a lot more pressure on the administration to take these folks to task, make sure they have the resources they need, but also that they have the legal levers and enforcement mechanisms they need to really get to the, you know, to, to really hold people accountable to their current responsibilities. Uh, I'm acutely aware of how much, uh, I, I spent a lot of time working actually in the South Bronx when, in an earlier period of my life, and and I'm acutely aware of the challenges associated with neighborhood revitalization. Uh, this is something that, that we need for our communities. We need to make sure that people are able to afford a home where they, you know, and be able to build and, and, and really put in deep roots. And a lot of these lenders are not, they're not, they're not interested in, in, in neighborhood revitalization. That's something that I'm very interested in as a local guy. And so if, if this is a matter of making sure the state gets more on the ball with regards to enforcement and really putting some 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 teeth into 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 policing this stuff. That's something I would 100% want to get behind. Great. Uh, last last question here. Uh, Colorado is estimating about 300 million dollars in revenue, including 3.5 million in January alone from the sale of recreational marijuana. What is your stance on marijuana use in California? Should it be solely for medicinal purposes or legalized for recreational use? And how should it be regulated? And what should be done with the tax revenue? Well, here we are in Venice. Exactly. It's already legal here, actually. Uh, <laughs> Every time I go down Venice Beach, it seems. Yeah. Um, uh, so actually, the good thing, you know what's great about Colorado uh, is that it's giving us, uh, we're, we're clearly headed in this direction. Um, I, I, and I, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I, the good thing about having Colorado and Washington is that we now have test cases. Let's, let's study their cases very carefully. Let's learn what there is to learn from, from their successes and their failures. And let's, let's craft legislation that will be smart, that will be regulated, that will really make sure that some of the key crime concerns are addressed. I, I want to make sure that there's a significant opportunities for local control so that local cities can kind of set their own, uh, you know, can, can have some control over, over what happens in their own, in their, within their own boundaries. Because I really do, you know, as a local government guy, I believe that local government's closest to the people and, and, uh, and, and, and individual communities ought to have the right to, to um, mm -hmm. you know, set their own standards. But... But I, I, this is, I, I voted for Prop 19. I, I, I think this is the direction we need to go. Uh, I think taxing and regulating and, uh, and you know, it, it's, the, it's the right thing to do. I will say I had a long chat with a doctor who wants to promote more edible rather than smokable because he says that uh, it's such a, there's so many, there's so many health concerns associated with, right. with smoking and lung, lung issues. And that's something for us to think about as we craft the legislation. Okay, thanks. Have a seat. All right.